Made possible by the Carnegie Council, the voice for ethics in international affairs. Our speaker today is the Honorable Romeo Dallaire, and he will be discussing the use of children in warfare. The treatment of child soldiers in combat is an ethical minefield. How did armies begin to use child soldiers, and what can the international community do to address the problem? We now present Canadian Senator and General Romeo Dallaire. What I'm doing is really based on my, a lot of my first experience in, in Rwanda and then subsequently in Sierra Leone and uh, Central Africa. Uh, I had a patrol in a village uh, that went into the village. The village was wiped out, uh, but the church was still standing, which was unusual because usually churches were slaughterhouses. So they went and they busted down the doors and there were about 150 people still alive there. And so the sergeant was on the radio calling my headquarters for trucks to move these people to a safer place. As he's doing that, there's about 30 boys and girls armed with AK-47s, 9, 10, 12, 14, 16, who open fire on him, his patrol, and the people he's protecting. The other side of the village come out of the woods, about 20 girls, same ages, some of them pregnant, and they're human shields behind which other boys and girls are shooting at the sergeant, at his patrol, and the people he's protecting. And the question is, what does the sergeant do? Doesn't have a breakfast, he's got nanoseconds, the bullets are flying, and people are being hit. What does he do? Do you kill children who kill? And when you do, what is the impact on your own soldiers who's got two kids back home? How many of them can they blow away to do their mission? I argue that we've stumbled into this new era since the end of the Cold War, into this postmodern era. We didn't sort of find leadership and we didn't have any sort of concepts of what really was going to come about. When George Bush Sr. said, if you remember at the end of the Cold War, we're entering a new world order. Well, it didn't take long, for as we were sort of pulling the forces back, and I remember uh, I was serving in General Sullivan, who was the commander of the U.S. Army, had to reduce the army from about 1.3 million to about 800,000, and on top of that, bring them all home. And he had less than four years to do that, but at the end of it, he had to make them more effective than they were before. In a time when, in fact, the enemy had disappeared. We started to realize that we had fallen into an era where that threat is ill-defined. But it is there. We stumbled into an era in which we didn't really have the tools to gain the initiative and to maintain the initiative at a time when so many countries started to implode. We had so many failing states. We had civil wars and, in fact, humanitarian catastrophes on scales that were unheard of and had taken the concept of never again and had thrown it out the window. Never again was for all of humanity, but it didn't work. And uh, it didn't work in as much as when it was tested in other scenarios, it failed. And so what do we do about that? Do we stand by and watch it? And one would say that as we sort of stumbled through the early parts of the 90s, that was a policy. Oh yeah, uh, they're in Africa, uh, and they're slaughtering each other. Uh, it's sort of nearly in their genes. You know, when things go bad, they'll go at each other and there'll be some killing and massacring for a short while and then we'll send in some money and some do-gooders and things will be like before. Well, things did not happen that way. One did not like before because we're not buying off dictators like we used to, to keep a grip on those countries, nor us, nor the other side. On the contrary, uh, we're telling them, hey, we want you to become a democratic state. We want to see the democratic institutions. We want to see rule of law, good governance, human rights, gender equality. And, and we want you to do that rapidly because if you don't, well, we may not be able to support you through the IMF or the World Bank or bilaterally because we are out of the business of dictators and holding countries nearly to ransom. We're in an era where we want the people 
to be able to believe in human rights. You want to expand that, and we want to expand democracy as the instrument of the guarantor thereof. And so it was quite a shock that all of a sudden all that was, in fact, falling apart, that we were being dragged into areas that some of us even had a hard time finding on the map, let alone going to your intelligence community and asking them for a briefing before you take off into the middle of a civil war to find out that the best they had was a four-year-old or five-year-old National Geographic assessment. And after I read National Geographic's uh, review of Quebec City, where I live, I've had a little bit of a more objective perspective to what's written on those pages at times. And so here we find ourselves in this new era where the threat was out there, the threat was to civil societies, the threat was putting under enormous duress our concepts of democracy, our concepts of human rights at a time when we wanted it to thrive, at a time when we felt that through the peace dividend and the stability of having this Eurocentric power uh, balance out of the way that we can actually see uh, enormous progression. Only to find uh, that new dimensions had entered into the fray. The other side, or the threat, or the, the bad guys, as we like to say, uh, were playing by a whole different set of rules than what we had been used to for nearly centuries. The, the classic uh, instruments of diplomacy, uh, of nation state, uh, of use of force that we had built under all the, uh, the different conceptual uh, instruments that led to war, yes, but within parameters of humanitarian law, law of armed conflict. When you had a group of politicians who were in power who saw that because of the expression of the people to go democratic, to bring in a multi-party system, to actually have representation and equal opportunities, rights as others, and when those in power realized that they would have to share that power, they didn't revert to actually, after being well-educated in schools in Canada, the United States, in Europe, I mean, they're not dummies. They were very well educated. They knew exactly how to maneuver and look at the, at the situation. They decide that the way they're going to hold power is we're simply going to wipe out the opposition. We're, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to kill 1.2 million people who are the threat to our ability to maintain near absolute power within a sort of dictatorship. And they implemented it. And we're talking 1993. And so they did. They slaughtered 700,000. They slaughtered about 100,000 of their own who were too reconciliatory. And they were on the way to continue. And it wasn't because we intervened. It wasn't because the UN called it a genocide and promised me troops that we that stopped. It intervened because the Rwandans successfully stopped the war themselves. But they actually created a scenario in which the other side is playing by none of the rules. And we saw it through Yugoslavia and the Somalias and, and, and Rwandas, of course, and as these in Srebrenica and, and, and the like, and, and this sort of uh, explosion of these catastrophic failures of references that we had where extremism was actually gaining the upper hand and doing it with near impunity started, of course, a reaction on our part of saying, what are we doing wrong here? Uh, why is this happening? How come we're not anticipating these things? How come, in fact, even when we're in the middle of them, we're not doing very well in attenuating them or, or reducing them or even stopping them? And so we entered the new millennium, not with a catastrophic failure of our information systems, which was the focus, if you remember, at the time. I mean, every computer and everything was going to crash, and how much did we worry about that? And that didn't happen. But what was crashing, however, was the structures of security, of human security, the structures of use of power, soft power, hard power, smart power. How, in fact, 
do we handle this era where we are seeing continued escalation of extremism and of non-compliance to any of the international conventions or laws and that they are getting away with it and they are destabilizing not only countries but it's starting to affect us uh, through access to natural resources that we want uh, and the impacts thereof. And then, why not? We have 9-11. That was sort of the, in French we say, la cerise sur le Sunday. That was sort of a culminating point. This got close to home. I live in Quebec City. New York is close to home. It's very close to home. And of course, the world power then is hit at home. And this was a shock to the world. And it was a shock to this nation also because there was this sort of sense of, of innate security uh, of the United States. Nobody had really ever attacked us at home. Uh, so, I mean, we had Pearl Harbor, but the sort of the, the landmass was protected. What was the reaction? How do we handle these new threats? And we haven't seen the threat of a new weapon that was invented during this time frame called the child soldier. It hasn't been seen on this continent. And at the end of the Cold War, nobody stood there and said, okay, we're gonna start demobilizing not only our nuclear weapons, but all also our non-nuclear, our classic uses of weapons. And so as an example, the Warsaw Pact and us had hundreds of millions of light machine guns and weapons available because they were in the mobilization stocks. They were still in the Greece that had been produced during the Cold War. Nobody said, right, we destroy all those because we don't need them anymore. The good civil servants said our people have paid taxes, those are still good, what do we do with them? Maybe we can make a buck, and we did. And so we had the proliferation of small arms, massive proliferation of small arms. And so you can get a brand new AK-47 for three bucks in these conflict zones. And the guy who's selling it is still making a profit. And so you have massive numbers of light machine guns that a nine-year-old can carry, use, maintain, and be quite effective on. And you've also, at the same sort of time, come to a crux in many of these countries where not only are we working on shifting gears towards democracy and so on, we're also seeing significant overpopulations. We're seeing many of the countries who can't even feed themselves anymore, already are in a dependency created by all the extraordinary work we did in reducing infant mortality by bringing in better hygiene. And so we increased their population, but we didn't give them anything to help them utilize all that brain power, all that manpower. We just increased the population, but we didn't, through our international development, build the infrastructure to employ them, to ed educate them, and to make them a thriving part of their societies. On the contrary, we created a whole whack of disenfranchised youth. We created that poverty exacerbated and the frictions exacerbated. And so all of a sudden, we are with countries where the demographics are over 50% are under the age of 15. You can go and abduct them from the schools and from the homes, and you take them into the bush, you line them up, you kill a few, you got access to drugs, you indoctrinate them, you arm them, you keep them under control through fear, you abuse the, the girls and some of the boys in order to completely deconst deconstruct any social structure, and then you use them as a primary weapon of conflict. So some people, when they read what I'm working on, they say, hey, the child soldiers, this is an old story. I mean, this is old hat. Well, it's true that we've seen youth in the past involved, drummer boys and bugle boys and sort of things of this nature. We've seen also Germany at the end of the World War II shift the Hitler youth into a militia and, and use you know, to the last man, last male, uh, defend the country, and so the youth were heavily engaged. And in fact, our forces uh, that faced them found them to be absolutely ruthless. I mean, totally immersed and ruthless and quite effective uh, when they were being used. But was that the norm? What were children in those historic conflicts really the primary weapon system of the conflict? Or were they sort of a last-ditch effort 
or just sideline sort of things. Well, what happened in Mozambique in the end of the 80s, as weapons became more prevalent and as the adult population was being hit by HIV AIDS and the problematics of the, the, the establishing uh, the power bases that they wanted to maintain, uh, they said, well, why don't we use these kids? And that's, it can't be more sophisticated than that because although the concept is sophisticated, it is brilliant in its simplicity. You have not found yet, we have not found a more sophisticated end-to-end low technology weapon system in the inventory. From upfront shooting and killing and maiming with, with absolute abandonment, because they're drugged up and they're under duress and, and fearful and they don't really know, in fact, all the parameters in which they find themselves in of right and wrong. I mean, they're nine, 10 years old, 12 years old, and adults are telling them to shoot and to kill and to maim. You've got also, because in many of these male-dominated societies, uh, the women do a lot of the work, so you have in there 40% of child soldiers are girls. 40%. And so they run the bivouacs. They are the logistics base. They get the food. And also, they are the sex slaves and bushwives of the commanders. I mean, there's nothing that meets this. And when they're sick or when they're injured, you just throw them in the bush and you will get some more. And there's all kinds of ammunition and weapons. So we stumble upon this weapon system that is effective, cheap, complete. And the question is, is how do we counter that? How, in fact, do we make the use of children a liability? How do we stop people reverting to using children as the primary weapon system of a conflict? Well, we are not unsophisticated, and so we looked at the problem. We had Gresham Michelle in 1996, the wife of Nelson Mandela, who did a seminal study on the problem, estimated there were about already 300,000 children at any one time in over 30 conflicts in the world that were the primary weapon, either by the state actor or non-state actor. And we got into the realm of let's find the solution. And what we did is we concentrated uh, with our good lawyer friends, of which there are a few probably here this morning. And we created love. We created in the UN uh, the whole domain of child protection in, in countries in conflict, of which child soldiers are part of it. We name and shame countries that use children and organizations that do it. We created the International Criminal Court, finally, and made the use of child soldiers a crime against humanity. And thank God, they also made rape a crime against humanity. It's called, they, they put it under the premise of torture and because rape is also one of the new weapons of our era. And one of the instruments of our era is to create rape sites, actually deliberately rape young women and children, uh, young women and, and girls uh, in order to create horror. And with horror, you instill fear. And with fear, you gain control on the population. So we entered an era where the civilian population is the primary instrument of gain of war, but also of conflict. And uh, the extremists in Rwanda were able to move 4 million people outside the country in the periphery. As a power base, they felt that they would be able ultimately to use to negotiate. And one of the ways they used it was not only by genocide, but also by rape and, and rape sites and, and do it. So where are we now, uh, 17 years, 16 years or so after uh, Gresham Michelle's study? Well, there is about 250,000 children still being used around the world in these conflicts. And we, although have all the means to arrest them and to put the uh, leaders into jail to fight the impunity of that, uh, there isn't much desire to do it. We don't want nuclear war. We don't want biological war. We're taking every effort we can even to fall into any possible classic war or conflict. But I haven't seen anybody saying, hey, the war in Sierra Leone was based on children, both sides. That's enough for us to intervene. The use of children as a weapon of war should be as abhorrent as using nuclear weapons, as using any other weapon. And I guess that debate is still there because all the NGO community, or the Bulgarian NGO community, which is working massively at demobilizing whatever can sneak out and rehabilitating and reintegrating them, 
and doing extraordinary work, the UNICEF, Save the Children, War Child, and, and so on. They're doing a lot of work. But no one, as I uh, looked into the problem in 2004 when I was at the Kennedy School, of these new concepts of conflict resolution, no one was actually looking at how to neutralize these children as a weapon system. And so I've created a bit of a stir of actually calling children weapons of war, of actually saying that stopping the use of child soldiers is not a social program, as we see even in the UN missions and so on, where we hand it over to the social people. It's a security problem. It's a mainstream security problem. And so how do we solve that? How do we neutralize that force? If it was a tank, it'd be a 90 tank system or another tank. So how do we stop the use of child soldiers? How do we prevent the solution being reverting to our fundamental right of self-defense or when we're tasked with a mission of protection to simply blow them away, or simply killing them? Do you kill children who kill, who are drugged up under duress and are not fully conscious of exactly what they are involved in. Not one country of the world in their doctrine have anything on child soldiers, which is not exactly true. I'm a graduate of the Marine Corps Staff College, and my Marine Corps friends, progressive as they are, and wanting to make sure they continue to serve the country and not get gobbled up by the Air Force and the Army, are always very inventive. And so uh, they, they had in their doctrine, they said, uh, in circumstances of facing child soldiers, uh, you are to avoid confrontation. Not very effective. The research we're doing still now in the field uh, and with academic rigor, because so much of the past has been anecdotal and sort of uh, uh, near emotional, we're bringing it through an academic rigor, through university study, professionally uh, research in the field and application with military, police forces, NGOs, and academics is we're trying to find the way to neutralize them without killing them. It can be everything from non-lethal weapons to how does the NGO trust the soldier, trust the policeman who's out there in the field and exchange the intelligence information they have to know what's going on and to find ways, indirect means of getting at the leaders, indirect means of protecting the villages, the youth, indirect means of sucking the children out of the system. And that's where we're at. We're still working at those indirect means. And I'll end with the following. We're in an era, ladies and gentlemen, where we're still stumbling through. We don't have the fundamental conceptual base of conflict resolution where we're involved from Haiti down here all the way up to Afghanistan, Iraq, maybe even Iran someday. And as we stumble through, as we move people into the field, we cannot give our politicians the warm, fuzzy feeling that we know exactly what we're doing. And because we don't have all those answers, it's difficult for them to take the decisions on what to commit. And it is more difficult for us in the field to resolve these incredible ethical, moral, and legal dilemmas of conflict resolution in our time. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator, could you comment on the problem of reconstructing a personality which has been totally deconstructed by the drugs and the horror and the rape and all the other things. Uh, what is your experience with that? It, it's interesting that not only are the, the youths who are caught up in this and how to bring them back is the soldiers, the professional soldiers we're sending in against them and how do we reconstruct them after they've been caught up in these dilemmas that have fried uh, in fact, part, physically, parts, uh, parts of your brain. So uh, how, how are we doing? In Sierra Leone, which was a war where both sides, the government and the non-government, used children, um, there was one psychiatrist in the country. So how do you rebuild that? How do you rebuild them, not only when you demobilize them, but they end up where a nation is still trying to reconstitute itself, and so they're in refugee camps or internally displaced camps for a couple of years also after that. The extraordinary power of the families, of the communities, as an example in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, is such that they're finding that they're able to re rebuild the, the, the youth back to power, except for the girls, because the girls have been used, abused. And in so many of those cultures, when a woman has been abused, they are shunned. 
the family shuns them, the community shuns them. And so you've got these girls who are abducted and so on, have been raped, probably have a child, maybe two, are sick, and you've got to rehabilitate them. The boys is sort of that warrior thing that sort of is you know, brought back in. But the girls, because they've been sullied in their context, they're abandoned. So that's bad enough. How are they going to crack back into their community with the child, which they don't even know how to give love to because they've not, they don't even remember it themselves, and, and sick? But then on top of that, how do they handle the stigma of having been used? And uh, we discovered when I was in, in, in Sierra Leone that, one, we could demobilize 10 boys for every girl because boys are less effective than girls. Girls can do all that I've described earlier on. But the girls, in order to get at them, to commence the rehabilitation, you had to crack through this incredible armor that they created of guilt. The society and the cultures are so strong that the girls actually feel guilty of having been abused. And you've got to break that. And so the only ones that have had any success so far that I've been able to see have been the International Red Cross Foundation who have programs of nine to 10 months where they actually keep them long enough to be able to work that through. The other NGOs, because of funding, often have three months, four months. The boys can work their way through it, uh, but the girls not. The resiliency of youth is phenomenal. Doesn't mean that they'll sleep well at night, but their ability, however, to go beyond it is quite impressive. possible by the Carnegie Council, the voice for ethics in international affairs. For more information, see www.carnegiecouncil.org.